Hey, Martin, how you doing? Nice to have you on board, mate. I'm sorry. Uh, do that again. Do that again. I thought that that's again. what you said this you were going to do. This is so staying in the podcast. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right, Ellie. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How you doing? Yeah, really well. Great, great. So you've probably um, seen Roman and I chatting away, boring people to death recently in this new podcast. <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, listened, I've listened to them. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, likewise. Um, so the whole idea came up as a result of uh, us bringing the team together, a team of like-minded people who share the same passion. We're all uh, we're all part of the retail trading circuit. We've all had our individual experiences. We've gone through a fair few things in, in our journeys, and it makes sense for us to be able to share those things with the audience of like-minded people who um, who could benefit from from sort of being a fly on the wall in a room full of people who they can relate to, who've shared their journey or who may be at some point in their journey where things we talk about they can relate to and and, um, hopefully find actionable. So I thought I'd bring together you and Roman at the moment to to sort of have these podcasts and uh, do our best uh, to help the, the trading audience. Sounds great. Sounds great. Nice one. So um, people have obviously seen plenty of you now (laughs) on the YouTube channel, um, delivering some excellent content. Uh, Things that we focused on together, um, you primarily have been, you know, distilling what is available in literature and practice and putting it in, uh, presenting it in a way that people can implement and uh, genuinely improve their outcomes. But that's the side of you people have noticed, and very much an instructional side. So with this podcast, I'd like to focus on the journey of Martin Tinsley from A to Z. Uh, And I want to bring out the the real you here, who you are, what you're all about, um, your background, personality, if you'd like to share that and how generally things influenced you over time in your life up until this point um, that led to you uh, adopting financial trading and doing what you do in it. So it'll be a very relaxed conversation. No pressure. Feel free to be absolutely yourself uh, at all points in the conversation and just uh, tell me your story. Let's start there. Tell me who is Martin Tinsley? Okay. Well, um I I started out, I guess, you know, if I if I talk about what led me to eventually become a trader, um, that might make sense because really over the years, although I never had any intentions of becoming a trader, everything that I did mm-hmm. led me in that direction. So let me tell you what I mean. So, you know, I, I started out um I I got my first computer when I was about twelve years old. Um, Way earlier I was, than myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I, was, I was <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I was one of the first in my class at school to mm-hmm. get a PC, not a PC, a, a computer. It was a Commodore sixty four. Oh, I used that too. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> right. Okay, we have and, that in common. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> Old, outdated junk hardware. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> We're yeah. off to but, a good but, start. <laughs> but but the fact the fact that um I only got that when I was 12 and I was one of the first maybe gives a few clues about how old I am. But but while all my friends were going That's away. That's the escape playing, key to shut down the, the operating system. <laughs> there <like>. you go. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and they were, you know, they were they were basically using computers to play games, which I did have as well, of course, but but what my what my real interest was 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 programming this thing, and mm-hmm. to write my own games, you know. So mm-hmm. not not the ordinary child, maybe, but that's what I used to get, you know, real satisfaction from was that actual development process and coming up with something that I could then invite my mates around and say, look at this, this is what I've written. You can you know let's let's play this game. 
And um, they, of course, were like, whoa, how have you done this? And I'm like, at well, 12, did you say? Learn to code. Well, I got my computer at 12, but oh, by right. the time I was sort of maybe 14, I was producing my first games. Mm-hmm. So, wow, impressive. Nothing commercial, of course, just for my own, just for my own use. Mm-hmm. But but then, you know, once I'd done that, I thought, you yeah, know, what, what can I do next? And so I started to get fascinated by the possibility of predicting events based on mathematical models. Okay. So this is maybe sort of I'm 14, 15 at this point. And of course, at that time, the problem was getting hold of data yeah. to be able to to feed into your models. Mm. And one of the things that was available at the time, not because I mean I never I never had a passion for football when I grew up. Mm-hmm. But regardless of that, I could get the data for football matches. You know, you get the league tables. Yeah. You can see how many goals for, goals against, mm-hmm. how well a team performs at home, how well they perform away from home. All yeah. of this information. And so I used to just plug this information in to try and predict what the scores would be at the weekend. Okay, and had a modicum of success with that, but what? <laughs> but 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 there was a there was a critical learning moment for me, um, which was the fact that it wasn't about being right. What it was actually about was looking at the probabilities, okay, mm-hmm. and and determining what the probabilities of Liverpool beating Manchester United were not saying one or the other is going to win. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and what you can then do, of course, not that I ever did because I was too young, Mm -hmm. but you could look at things like the odds of what are the odds of Liverpool beating Manchester United. Okay. Then you can say, well, okay, if they're the odds, what are the probabilities? Would that represent value if you were to place a bet on that, okay? And it was that realization of value as opposed to being right Mm. or wrong that eventually, although I never had any intentions at the time, Mm -hmm. eventually fed into my understanding of the financial markets. It had a really strong influence on you very early on in your life then. It did, it did, very much so. Um, and, and, you know, I still believe that fully to this day. It is about probabilities. It's not being about being right and wrong. Mm-hmm. So if you have a bad trade, well, just it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't. One trade matters nothing. Mm-hmm. It is the, the long term. And as long as you're trading with probabilities on your side, it's that that is going to determine if you're successful or not. So that's really interesting. How did that influence at such an early age then uh, affect your your choices as you grew older? Um, by choices, I'm referring to, um, you know, schooling and later on, mm. uh, if you went to university, how it impacted your your sort of career path, your choice mm-hmm. there, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me more about that so I can develop, a, and anybody listening can develop a picture of how somebody who approaches, who who is in financial trading today, how his background evolved that led him here. Well, well, strangely, you know, it, it, it didn't. It, it sort of ended at that time. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I got into, you know, taking exams at school and then college and, and university, I sort of went away. I, I never, I never coded for years, mm-hmm. and moved completely away from that. And that was almost it was in my past, if you like. Um, although you know the the mathematical mindset was of course still there, and that's what I concentrated on. So eventually, when I went to university, you know, I studied physics, mm-hmm. um, which which is pretty much you know. 90% mathematics. Mm-hmm. And and so it influenced me, I guess, because my passion was mathematics. That That's the career, that's the educational path that I took. And actually, you know, the first job I got after university as well was very highly mathematical um, role that I had, but also required me to code. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so I got back into 
the the world of coding at that point but at this time instead of coding in basic on a commodore 64 <laughs> I'd, I'd moved to the you know the x86 chipset and I, I was coding in a more you know i was coding in c plus mm plus -hmm. so a more sort of industry standard language and that was a huge learning curve but but again when i look back now you know never any intention of trading at that point but when i look back that really molded me as a person to make me ready for trading because what i had to do in that role Mm -hmm. I, I was working at a university, working with the researchers within the, within a department, and the researchers needed to analyze vast quantities of data, mm -hmm. okay? real time as well. So mm -hmm. there's the you know they would be hooking if you like patients up to uh, an EEG monitor mm -hmm. to monitor brain patterns ecg to monitor what was happening with the heart and and so i had to develop applications that took this data in real time processed it did whatever they needed it to do and then to feed back to the person and and the researcher real time so that it could lead the experiment so that, so that they could go through the experiment so so i was having to from up, you know, going from a point of only developing applications in basic, now to have to do this real time analysis really quick, you know, speed was of the essence. All with it, lots of data. Yeah, with, um, with all of this data, mm -hmm. um, process it, and, and, you know, milliseconds later almost have to feed back to, to, the, to, to the, um, the person who was being monitored to, to give you that sort of full feedback loop, which would mm -hmm. then, in, change the way they would their brain patterns would change based on the feedback and things like that and so incredibly interesting job and and again just started to give me the skills that i would then need to eventually become an algo trader very interesting so you've had a strong technical background then from the sounds of it um, primarily due to your influences early on in your life, uh, your interest in modeling things, not necessarily anything to do with financial trading, but more for enjoyment and satisfaction. Um, uh, and then later on, that influenced your academic choices at university and hence your career choices when you left university. So where from there then? Um, how did the Martin Tinsley of today uh, creating strategy portfolios, how is that person born as a result of uh, things you were a part of uh, in, in your career uh, up until that point? Currently, you're in a performance environment, which is financial trading, mm -hmm. where you have to make sure that you've, that you've done the appropriate work necessary to ensure that the end outcome is reliable. And uh, it's really nice to see how you've migrated that experience to financial trading, where you're, in essence, doing the same things. You're ensuring robustness, making sure your decisions are informed, and you're using a variety of either existing or proprietary tools or methodologies to arrive at that. Would I be, would I be accurate in saying that your, your background still exists to this day, just in a different industry? I find that fascinating. Yeah, I've I've effectively applied it to a different industry. Yeah, that's exactly right. How did you get into the financial industry? How did you get into uh, algorithmic trading generally? I imagine that you've, um, from what I've spoken to you about very briefly, you mentioned in our past conversations offline, of course, that you didn't have much of an affinity for discretionary trading. I'm referring to a step just before that mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm, which is... Mm -hmm. How did you arrive at trading? I imagine data being an influence, technology being an influence, and all your experience yeah, yeah. Uh, contributing to that. So just tell me more about that. Let people hear that part of the story. Okay. Well, I, I remember the moment distinctly. Actually, it was it yeah. was a it was a moment. And so I was I was sat in, um, in in the office with a colleague, and I could see him looking at this. this I thought was just a graph. Okay, I mm -hmm. thought, oh, okay, what's that? That looks interesting because it had all these lines over it. 
And, and I was actually at the time I was working for a um, a US tech company um, in the field of neural networks, and I was I was a consultant um, implementing neural networks on customer sites. So again. Mm-hmm. I won't go into that in any detail, but but again, mm-hmm. that influenced my path as well. Mm-hmm. And and I, I I said, what what's this graph you've got here? You know, I didn't recognise it as something that we we worked with. And he said, oh, it's um it's a graph of the the FTSE 100. Okay, it's a chart of the FTSE 100, and it had all these. I'm like, what are all these lines? <laughs> and he said, they're called <laughs> indicators. <laughs> you know, they're called indicators. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I can just imagine was, the Martin Tinsley of today <laughs> talking to the Martin Tinsley back like, then. <laughs> Get oh, yeah, your yeah. act together, mate. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> and and uh, he was saying, look, these two lines here, these are these are called moving averages. Okay, mm-hmm. and when they cross over. Look what happens to the price, and then look what happens when they cross over the other way. And this light bulb went on in my head. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, this is this is really interesting. Okay, and from that moment, I was hooked. Mm-hmm. Okay, so obviously, what did I do? I went away, downloaded a simple platform, started to look at, you know these moving averages thing other indicators what particular markets were you looking at out of interest oh n- didn't didn't care less at that time ali i wasn't okay. trading not trading at all just purely looking at the possibility of the predictive nature of the markets yeah i didn't care what it was at all sure it was i was more interested in the maths than i was the markets mm-hmm. at that time and you know I sort of digged into it a little bit and then sort of went away from it, came back to it again. And it was probably a couple of years before I thought, you know, actually, let's revisit this and see if actually I could potentially work out a model that would be able to predict future price movements. And so I started to get into it in a little bit more detail. But at the time, I was doing it with a sort of a discretionary mindset, which is strange because given my history, you might think I would have just gone straight into algo trading. Yeah, I'd have imagined but, that. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't. I didn't I, I've always, I've often asked myself the question, why didn't I? And I, I don't honestly don't know. So mm-hmm. I started to use charts in a systematic way, a technical way to try and, you know, predict what would happen so opened up a demo account with a broker started to place some demo trades you know modicum of success i guess realized i was not going to make money doing the thing doing things the way that i was so I just started bought a few books started to read about the market started to get a better idea of how they work a better idea of what it is that moves price You know, getting that fundamental, I guess, understanding of how markets interrelate as well. Mm -hmm. And with that, I then went back again to discretionary to try and apply that knowledge that I'd gained, you know, by by reading about this and sort of tried again and, and a little bit more success this time, I think, because one of my realizations at that point was that this isn't about indicators okay all all the indicators do actually is dilute price action mm-hmm. okay so they're incredibly useful but you have to understand that when you put an indicator on a chart and start to look at the details of the indicator you're losing valuable information from the price action That's yes the, you know and and so Again, you know, moving forward, I, I use indicators. Of course, I use indicators. I still use them today, but there's also a much stronger in emphasis on actual price action mm-hmm. and what the price, the fundamental price action is doing. And I'm I'm fascinated by what drives, you know, the patterns in price action and how that drives the markets to to move. And and so at that point, then I think I started to think, okay, I might actually have a chance here. So I opened up a real trading account. But as soon as I did that, things 
changed <laughs> in me. In me, I changed. Okay, mm. and and what? No wait, wait, I, wait, one take, one take. Let me bring in the drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I realised pretty quickly is that my character, my personality, is not suited to discretionary trading, and primarily, the thing that I would say is is my biggest downfall is a lack of patience no, okay you just so, struck so, me as a fairly patient person but all right no not not when it comes to to to, to discretionary trading okay so so right. i wanted okay. to be i wanted to be in the market okay mm-hmm. i had this desire to get into the market and so <laughs> i had this set of rules that's pretty full on <laughs> i, 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 I <laughs> <laughs> I always found discretionary difficult, but I, I wasn't as uh, as fire driven like you. So that's right. interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I had a, I re- they were written down. These are my rules. OK, and I will not break these rules. These are what I will do. But when I was sat there in front of a chart and it wasn't time to open the trade, you know, it was nearly there, but not quite. I'd open it anyway. I just didn't mm-hmm. have the patience. And and my finger would be hovering over the mouse button, you know, and I'd be like, don't do it. But I, <laughs> I did it. I did it. I did it. And and also, you know, when it came, oh, you know, a trade went into profit. I I knew I should let the profits run. I knew I should. <laughs> but I just, oh, no, I'm going to take, take it now. Take the profit I've made. You know, and it was things like this that I battled with for probably a year mm-hmm. okay and i i would i appreciate you sharing this <laughs> this uh this uh detail because mm. there are probably a fair few people listening right now who can relate to this really well i'm, sh- I'm sure including there are myself lots of which is yeah. in the beginning i was pretty much like this um mm. when i first approached the industry and uh, in your case, you had the patience, like you say, you don't have of lasting a year. I lasted barely a week before I said, no, wow. this, this has to be something I have to code. <laughs> I'm simply not not cut out for this finger hovering business. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it took me longer to reach that decision, you know, and, and I would I would promise myself I wouldn't make that mistake again. I promise myself. But I just couldn't help it. And eventually I said, right, enough's enough. Enough is enough. What am I doing? I I have good coding experience here. Mm-hmm. I need to make my. I need to put my rules into a an algorithm. I need to code them, and then I need to set that running, and I need to walk away mm-hmm. and not look at that chart. Good decision. And let <laughs> it let it do what it can obviously do far better than I can do because you know algorithms don't suffer with a lack of patience and but and as long as I could codify my rules I knew that would be a far far better approach and it took it took a while then I probably I probably took a year out of actively trading I probably didn't place a trade for in, in a real account for a year and I spent that year developing my 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 algo, okay, wow. for my first system. It was it was a pretty intense period. But remember, you know, I was working at this point. I was working fifty, sixty hour weeks in my full time job, which didn't leave a lot of time. Yes, I and so and so this is you know this is burning the midnight oil doing mm-hmm. this. It's not like I was doing this full time. Well, props so, to you for making time for something you were passionate about. That's mm. that's admirable. A lot of people tend to lose um, lose focus when other things more pressing tend to come into the picture. But kudos to you that you you persevered. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, and and after that point, I never I never looked back. So so that's how I became an algo trader. There you go. A long winded way of telling you how I got here. So you're at this point now where you've made the decision to not uh, subject yourself to discretionary trading mm-hmm. um, and you've uh, leveraged you've begun to leverage your um, already exhaustive background in uh, programming from your career pursuits to 
uh, to employ those in, in financial trading. So here begins your journey as a retail financial trader. Uh, tell me more about the, the sort of things that happened from this point onwards. You've now decided that you're going to be algorithmic and non, not discretionary. Where did you go from here? What what things came came into your life at each step of the way? Stuff like that. A fast forward, hopefully as visual as you've done so far, <laughs> version of those events <laughs> would, be, would be appreciated. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I guess, you know, one of the... One of the revelations when I started out now algo trading was that while I was developing this 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 algorithm, I always imagined that once I had that first system in place, hopefully making money, that would be that would be it really in terms of the learning. And that 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 would be I'd, I'd have I'd have done what I set out to achieve, and at that point it would have just been a case of, you know, thinking of well, okay, what's my next strategy going to be? Implementing that. However, what I learned fairly quickly mm, and continue to learn. The meat arrives on the bones. Let's go. <laughs> Keep talking. My nice time is 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 that there are there are so many facets to trading in general, okay, and algo trading, that as soon as you get to a point where you you think you understand something about the markets, something else emerges that you realize actually you didn't you don't know anything about. Okay. So it's one of those things, it's like peeling an onion. You you think, you know, you think you've got it, and then you just realize there's another layer beneath. Mm-hmm. And and for me, that's what I love, actually. You know, for some people, I think that might be frustrating, but for me, I love it because I continue to, to, to learn new techniques. And, you know, con- it's this continual improvement that I am convinced will never end, by the way. You know, I, I don't think I'll ever get to a point where I can say, yep, I know it all now, you know. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So what I found happens is, you know, I've always been one of these people who has a to-do list, okay? Mm -hmm. I I love to-do lists. Everything goes on a to-do list. It doesn't matter if it's my personal life, my work life, whatever. I'm really pleased about several things you're saying. We have so much in common that has absolutely (laughs) nothing to do with trading. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I don't know how people manage without them, to be honest. But but um, and, and what I found that happens if if we think about you know my algo trading life, the list of things that I want to investigate and research just continually gets longer and longer. So I'm ticking things off. I tick them off, but for every one I tick off, another five are added to the list. Okay, and this is all realization from me that gosh, there's so much more I need to know, you know, in order to be the best I can possibly be. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so this this list grows, and obviously I'll never get to the bottom of this list. I've accepted that now, but it's a case of you know prioritization and okay, what's the next thing that I need to do? What's going to have? It all comes down to this effort versus value, doesn't it? You know, and what is the what's the thing that I'm going to get most value in terms of the effort I have to put in to get that knowledge for something that I can then start to implement into my my systems. Um, and you know that that's the wonderful thing actually with algo trading is that when you get one of those eureka moments where you've you know you've investigated something and you've found that you can actually turn that to your advantage maybe it's something that increases your edge a little bit Mm -hmm. or maybe it's something that just reduces risk whatever it is you know these things that you 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 come up with and you find the beauty of algo trading is that you can then build that into your algorithms and then it just takes care of itself. You know, that, that's, that's what I love. So you've done all the hard work. You've implemented it in your algo. And then your algorithm from now until the day I die 
can take advantage of that. And so that that effort that I put in was really worth it. And that's another thing, I guess, where personally, you know, I, I struggle with discretionary trading because with discretionary trading, you know, you're continually having to exert that effort, continually having to re you know, redo everything again and again for each trade that you take. And and that's something as well that I struggle with. So so again, for another reason, algo trading is very much suited to the way I sort of operate. For sake of scale as well, like in your case, you've now got I don't know how many Darwins listed on the Darwin Exchange where you're you've effectively listed your trading strategy in order to attract third party capital. We'll get to that point in your journey further down the line. Um, but to arrive at that point, you have to have gone through an extended period of experimentation, um, success and failure, probably more failures than successes. Mm. And uh, it's only those lessons that we are able to, if we're able to accommodate those lessons in future efforts, do they result in progression, right? Do they yeah. let yeah. us go from bad outcomes to moderate outcomes to potentially decent outcomes and so on and so forth. They, there is a, a common notion in uh, in at least the beginner crowd, um, even some intermediates, in fact, that the strategy, if you arrive upon it, will be the strategy forever. And the reality of the markets is that because it's an evolving mechanism, uh, you know, an evolving organism on its own, it's simply a matter of time and volume <laughs> before edge that is widely being used by several participants, either the same edge or a variation uh, thereof, will lead to that edge diluting over time. And that's what requires us to constantly either look for new sources of edge or to optimize existing edge so that it's more competitive than it was before, right? Hence yeah. the ever-increasing to-do list, because it's simply impossible to have a finite to-do list if you're in this sector. Unlike other industries, for instance, industries from your background, such as physics and uh, sports psychology, where evolution is there, but evolution isn't as fast-paced, for instance, as is the, in the financial markets, where evolution is near daily <laughs> uh, yeah. compared to other markets. So I'd like to hear um, a little bit more about the bad moments, like the moments where, for instance, one feels that the no matter what you may have done up until that point in time, it hasn't resulted in something you can consider working forever, which uh, by definition is not possible, but it's still something we aspire to. Um, I'd like to hear more about those experiences on your on your side, um, where moments where you could have potentially left algorithmic trading altogether as a pursuit that no longer yields the the benefits you were hoping to achieve with it. Uh, so people listening to this, a lot of whom will relate to to that, can mm -hmm. can hear another person and how that person persevered through those moments. I'd like I'd like if you would. Uh, for you to share a bit more uh, there too. Mm, okay. Um, as you were sort of talking through that, I guess two things came to mind, and and there was both of them were incredibly challenging times, and I guess could have one of them especially could have led to me just giving up algo trading and and just moving on mm -hmm. to to you know concentrate on my career elsewhere sure um now, now the f the first was i suppose it comes back to this point where you talked about systems losing edge okay and in in the early days i mistakenly i now know i confused um complexity with sophistication mm -hmm. very common occurrence we've all been yeah. through it myself mm -hmm. myself included so it's nothing yeah, to, yeah. Uh, no, no, nothing of a reflection on anyone complexity does not <laughs> translate yeah. to, uh, to, um, 
uh, successful. Okay. It, 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 no, it, do, it doesn't. You know, and, and for, for for me, I, I always thought you know that the, the more complex a trading strategy was because obviously when you're an algo trader, you can make it as complex as you want. You can just keep adding and adding and adding to the complexity. And I I equated that to being okay. If I do that, that's going to make the strategy more successful. Having said that, though, I should just disclaim, complexity in strategy design is probably not the best thing, whereas architecture design um, almost Mm -hmm. always will require it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so I'm talking about adding another rule and another rule and another rule to the strategy is what I'm talking about in terms Mm -hmm. of complexity. And and that, that resulted in two things. First of all, I, you know, I learned fairly quickly that that led very much to overfitting. Okay, that's the Mm -hmm. the first thing. The second thing was that even if I had a successful strategy that was complex, what tends to happen is those strategies tend to move out of tune of the market very quickly. Okay. Because they're so they're so specific about when they trade. And and so you end up with a huge headache of continually re-optimizing to try to maintain that edge. True, yes. And and this was, you know, it was getting to the point where I had no time for anything else. And and at that point, I had this, you know, I had this sort of desire to 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 move away from that. And I really went back to first principles. And the first principles that I went back to were the most common patterns you see in the markets. Okay, things like, you know, if you look at a chart, you can look at a chart for any asset class. And you will always see the most common patterns, mm-hmm. things like trading ranges where the, you know, the, the, the market stagnates for a period of time. You then have a breakout from that. Okay. Often after the breakout, a trend evolves. Okay. And these really common patterns are what I now target. Okay. And by doing that in a very simplistic way, that is what I have found maintains your edge for longer. Okay. So so these are very, you know, I I am a big fan of Perry Kaufman. Okay. Ah, and he, yes, you and me and he he has this, he has this saying actually, which is loose fitting pants. Are better than tight fitting pants. Yeah. And what he means by that is he means using rules that are very generalized, okay, and not specific and very loose, really, in the way that they they, um, take advantage of market moves. And that is one of the most important things I, I read was that you know that is the approach you should take to the markets because when you do firstly it's quicker to build a system secondly they tend to maintain their edge for much longer okay because these patterns have repeated for decades and they still repeat yeah. today because they're driven remember these patterns are driven by psychology Okay, Correct, and yes. and when when market participants or algorithms see patterns, they behave in a certain way. People behave in a certain way, just like the algorithms do, and that then causes the next type of pattern to emerge. And these things just repeat and repeat and repeat, time and time again. So that is the that's the first that's the first thing I guess that was the the thing that I moved away from. And if I I truly believe if I hadn't moved away from that more sort of complex type of um, way of tackling the markets, 
I probably wouldn't be algo trading today because I'd, ju- I'd have just got so sick and tired of having to continually re-optimize and 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 also you know just just the the type of work would have been different and wouldn't have interested me as much. So it sounds so to me personal. like you're um, uh, sorry to cut you off there. Uh, okay. um, so it sounds to me like your your focus has almost always been on, uh, if I'm not mistaken, non intraday or at least non very low time frame um, strategies. Would that be accurate? So it's accurate in the sense of I, I'm not a scalper for sure. Okay, mm-hmm. I don't trade news. That's I what I was referring to. Scalping yes, yeah. strategies. Okay, but but many of the systems I have do go down to you know operating off metrics from the five minute chart. So mm-hmm. relatively low time frame, but but not you know my, my my trades tend to last a couple of hours, one to two hours minimum. Mm-hmm. I'm not the kind of person who's executing trades that are lasting three seconds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so that was the first thing, and the the other the other thing actually was, um, and this may be well may well be something other people can relate to as well, was um, I, I'm obviously not going to mention any names here, but I I had bad experiences with brokers mm-hmm. at the time. You know, early imagine, on yes. when I didn't know what I was looking for in a broker. Um, and I was just going for, I was going for the brokers that were, let's say, advertising on sports shirts, things like that. You know, the mm. the, the ones that you think, okay, they've got to be a credible organisation. Surely, if they're um, if they're advertising on this sports club, they're going to be they're going to be a pretty good organisation. Sure. What I found was that that those two things didn't necessarily equate. Mm-hmm. And I, I had bad experiences where I got into, you know, where, where there'd been certain price spikes, things like that, that had taken trades out of the market. And when you compared that to other brokers, the price spike didn't exist. And it's like, well, why did it exist with this broker? What's mm-hmm. going on? And And eventually, you know, I investigated, learned about, things that tend to happen with certain brokers and became very disenfranchised with the whole thing Mm -hmm. because my sort of view was, well, look, if my broker's not on my side, if my broker doesn't want me to succeed, that's a problem. That's a Mm -hmm. conflict of interest. So, Mm -hmm. so at that point I had this revelation that, okay, you know, I need to, I need to focus some time and effort now just actually getting a broker that's going to support me with what I want to do and mm-hmm. aligned with me, if you like. Is so, that so what that brought was, you that, to Darwin X, would you say? It is. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and but, but, but before I came to Darwin X, that was one of those moments where I almost threw the towel in and said, ah. I can't. I Traders, retail traders, I came to the conclusion, cannot make money when all the brokers out there are are against them okay Mm -hmm. and and obviously with research and eventually yes i i did find darwin x and realized that okay actually all brokers aren't like that Mm -hmm. you've just got to be really careful about rigorous research yes Uh uh-huh it's actually one of the reasons um, Juan Colon, the CEO and co-founder of the company, we did a series of videos last year or the year before. I can't remember now. The COVID pandemic has phased my memory. Um, <laughs> we, we did a series of videos on precisely these themes. Yeah. So this is, is this the Brokernomics course that you're talking about? This is uh, the Brokernomics the, course. That is correct. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. So, so that is the thing I needed back way back mm. you know uh, and it, th- there was very little available that that you know of, was of that quality that you know and i i sort of had to find it all the hard way but but if there is anyone listening that that's an absolute must you know if you're if you're thinking about who your next broker is going to be that is what you should be watching because it, it explains you know in very practical in a very practical sense, what you need to be looking for to make sure you're making good decisions. Um, and, and especially for anyone who's thinking of, you know, 
having trading as a career, mm-hmm. it's it's absolutely essential that you do that homework. It's one of the most important things you need to do. So, um, yeah, I just wish that was available when I was going through this. Yeah, I, <laughs> I would put myself in the same boat. We've we've all been through experiences that, in hindsight, we um, would rather not have had. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, those same experiences led led us to where we are at the moment. Um, and in Darwin X, being able to scale the effort so that it can return something more meaningful than is otherwise possible with just our own capital, right? Um, yes. And therein comes another. Um, another picture altogether to do with the asset management side in that you're able to avoid all the costs, both legal and infrastructural, in uh, listing your talent up for investment, mm-hmm. um, as you are with your Darwin assets on the exchange. Uh, and that's something that simply didn't exist prior to Darwin X existing. And uh, so that's that's I'm sure a podcast episode worth four or six four to six hours on its own that you and I could do at a later stage. Otherwise, we'll be yeah. here all day. I'm fairly certain of that. <laughs> um, but no, thanks for sharing that. That's uh, that's uh, I'm sure people who are listening to this can relate to a lot of what you've said. I certainly do because I've I've had a similar sort of upbringing in this industry um, as as yours, being somebody with. Uh, technical roots myself. Um, And there's a lot still left for us to talk through, which we'll keep for another episode. We'll we'll continue from where we leave off here today, which is uh, essentially the journey of Merton Tinsley from Commodore 64 games programmer (laughs) (laughs) to, to to physics industry, to sports psychology, application of data driven methodologies, technology, engineering background, transferred over to financial trading quite comfortably due to the similarities in in technical requirements, your journey from the beginning, the the goods and the bads, um, how your opinion evolved over time, both of the industry as well as the participants in the industry. By that, I mean both the traders in the industry as well as the people acting as the intermediaries, the brokers. Um, and how that brought you here to where you are now. So in in like subsequent episodes, I'd love to dig deeper into each of those things and focus really f- fine tune our discussion to each of those topics so people can hear um, an even more detailed view of each, each event in yeah, the journey that you've described so far. And it'll be super fun, at least for me. I can't speak for everybody else listening to this. <laughs> but me, for instance, I love being able to hear others' experiences and, and find bits that I can and learn and improve from. And also there's there's benefit to be gained from simply just relating to another person's experience. It, there's a, a level of satisfaction in just being able to relate to someone so that you don't uh, consider yourself as the only person, for instance, who may have had that experience. So I'm really thankful that you, you've come on and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you both as my teammate in the Alpha team and also to listen to you as a practitioner who I'm interviewing <laughs> here. And um, we'll have one of these one day where, where you can put me through the same exercise and I'll, I'll, I'll try and be as <laughs> I'll try and be as thorough as you have so far today. And I uh, look forward to the next few coming up. So if anybody has any comments about what Martin's spoken about today, uh, as you're listening to this, if you have ideas, Uh, for what we could be talking about, please do feel free to share them in the comment section below if this is what you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening to this on Spotify or any other podcast channel, then uh, please do subscribe to notifications as well as leave your comments there or or write into us at info at darwinx.com and share your thoughts there where we've got multiple channels both on social as well as email for you to share your thoughts and we look forward to receiving your feedback and evolving uh, this podcast series as we hear from you so thanks so much for your time martin and uh, catch you again very, very soon because I'm intrigued. I've already got a to-do <laughs> list in my head. <laughs> yeah, like, it's been uh, my pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. It's been fun. So yeah, yes. I look forward to the next one. Likewise, mate. Thank you very much. Okay. Cheers, Ali. Bye now. Cheers, mate. Bye.